on a on the daily in some cases, which will resonate with psychedelics researchers. So I'm not talking about philosophers yet. I'm just talking about classical Greeks, for example. We have a tradition of these people in ancient Greece who sort of died out in maybe the fifth century, fourth century BCE, who would practice soul flight. Uh, they would leave their bodies. They would fly to another place, get information there, which they would bring back to their communities that would then be used for healing. Uh, this is probably a familiar trope to many of you, a familiar cultural trope. People are often called the Greek shamans. Um, we have a rich um, dossier of religious reports, including things like the second century hero Logoi of Elias Aristides, who um, records many, many face-to-face -face encounters with the goddess Clepius and Isis and many other gods. So um, this experience, what's called Epiphania, where you see a god in front of you, sometimes it's a god, sometimes it's a daimon, which is kind of a lesser god, Sometimes it is a spirit of a dead person, um, and the dead are useful to talk to because they have information that the living don't have. Um, this was remarkably common in antiquity. And like I say, we have a dossier for it. We also have in the ancient Greco-Egyptian magical corpus, lots and lots of papyri in, uh, were preserved in the sands of Egypt of a, of a rich and flourishing magical practice. We have uh, Recipes for intentionally getting an epiphania, so making a god appear to you, uh, often in a dream, but often like literally sitting in a chair across from you. Uh, and people, we know people did this. We know people saw gods all the time. Also of interest, perhaps, to people who work on psychedelics, <laughs> uh, encountering ancestral spirits. This is something that a lot of modern day uh, plant eaters would um, resonate with, or weird entities that you don't know quite what they are or you try to figure out what they are after the experience. And then last but not least, we you all have read about the Eleusinian mystery cults. There were many other mystery cults in antiquity. These cults are interesting to us in a number of ways. They reliably would produce an experience, like a transformative experience. The Eleusinian mysteries were famous for producing an experience whereby people went to the cult, they were initiated, and afterwards they lost all fear of death. Now, this is already resonant with a lot of psychedelic research, right? People who have an experience and go, oh my God, I didn't realize death was an illusion. And then I ate that heroic dose of whatever. And then it was completely clear that death is not a big deal for whatever, however you then frame that. This was produced reliably in the Eleusinian mysteries year after year for thousands of people. Uh, and we still don't know what happened. But we do know that they drank this, they all drank this potion at the beginning called the Kikyo. So, now, here comes the confession part of my talk. Um, I don't think any of these people were taking anything that would be re regarded as psychedelic today. Um, there's lots of research. Every, you know, the, the, the <laughs> assumption is there, well, okay, the Lysinian mysteries, how do we explain this? Okay, there was something in the drink, right? There was some, like, psychoactive thing in this drink that people went in, and then they had the whole ritual set and setting, and they, they had their minds blown, and they realized death wasn't real. How else do you explain this, being able to repeat this thing? However, loads of research has been done on this since the 1960s, when it first became something people talked about in respectable academic circles. And if you really look into this evidence, there just isn't any evidence. So you'll get like the, the idea that maybe there was ergotism and they were knew how to harness that in the Kaikion because it contained barley, and therefore they were, they were and all kinds of witch doctory type stuff. No offense to witch doctors, but at, at the bottom, the, the kind of things that people were inhaling in these rituals, we know we have lists of ingredients, a lot of it, stuff like myrrh and frankincense, uh, flowers, stuff like this. And you could say, well, maybe they had like special psychic, they knew the ways of plants and they knew psychedelic ways to make these things potent, maybe. Um, interestingly, we don't have any hard evidence for this. And there's lots and lots has been written about it. Recently, someone has come out and said like, obviously the early Christian Eucharist was a psychedelic thing. How else can you explain these conversion experiences, so on and so forth. If you really look at this data, um, it all falls apart into myrrh and frankincense, essentially, and kind of hints that maybe myrrh and frankincense are more psychedelic than we think. Uh, I don't think the ancients had access to much that we would call a really strong psychedelic substance. There's someone recently say, was speculating on how they got the fly agarics to Egypt. There must have been like this whole like fly, like northern, you know, shamans running a hotline of mushrooms to this, this dry country where no mushrooms grow. 
You, so the point I want to make here, there are two points I want to make here. One, I will not be angry if someone does find, if someone finds a cup that the Kaikion from the Lunar City Mysteries and then it does an analysis and go, whoa, crazy alkaloids, this was a psychedelic brew. I will not be angry at all. That, that will make me very happy and it's very interesting. However, what I want to demonstrate today is that um, you don't need psychedelics, in quotes, to have psychedelic experiences. In fact, the, maybe the most psychedelic thing you can do is philosophy. And uh, the Platonists are um, a case in point, as we shall see from a bunch of Platonist trip reports, which we'll look at today, um, of extremely, you might say, altered states of consciousness. Um, so we might just quickly look at the term psychedelic. It's interesting because it's, of course, about clarifying the soul, right? The psyche. <laughs> now, <laughs> the notion that there is such a thing as a psyche, a soul, that is separable from uh, the body in principle, it enters the main philosophical discourse precisely in Plato. You can say Plato invented the soul, perhaps, in the modern, it's the sense, in, in the sense of a unified organ of consciousness. Um, th there was, a, there's a lot in Plato's forerunners, like the Pythagoreans and the Orphics, that feeds into that, but because Plato also invents philosophy as a term, philosophia, another thing that's the ancients always all say, Pythagoras was the first person to talk about. In terms of our written uh, record, Plato is the first person. <laughs> he invents philosophy, and in philosophy, he starts talking about a thing called the soul. So, playing with etymology a little bit, it seems like a good place to start looking for psychedelic things, right? He's invented this thing called the soul, he's told us about it, and he's into clarifying its contents, understanding it, understanding how epistemology works, understanding how the soul can interact with the body and all this other stuff. So on the basic etymological level, of course, Platonism is of course gonna be psychedelic, but you all know that that's not what we mean by psychedelic in the general run of the mail conversation. We mean, um, among other things, well, you probably have all had methodological conversations up to your ears about what we mean by psychedelic and uh, probably hardly sick of it. So I won't even try to uh, get involved. But um, I will just say this. And these are kind of the main points I want to make today, which I'm going to then flesh out. So that was preamble. Now we're getting into the, the main um, talk. So I don't mean Platonist. Platonism, ancient Platonism, is psychedelic in this kind of haha etymological sense. I mean it in these specific ways. Plato, the philosopher from Athens, provided a framework of thought which some of his followers in later eras used to journey to realms of imminent reality lying behind our reality, or normally invisible, but part of reality, a non-physical place where meaning is a self-revealing truth act, where time and space simply do not exist, where overpowering visions of light seem to have been a major component of experience. This was uh, what a Platonist philosopher was aiming at, and they did it. Some of the followers of Plato also developed techniques, also of interest probably to some psychedelics researchers, uh, seemingly borrowed and adapted from the, the more widespread magical culture at large, for encountering gods and other entities face to face. And they did so routinely. And last but not least, finally, a few Platonists both theorized and practiced an ascent journey into inner space. It might interest some of you to know that the first reference in the Western canon to going inward, to traveling inward, is in the Platonist uh, philosopher Plotinus. And we'll get back to that. Uh, the, the very quotation in which he invents the idea of going inward for the West. The idea of traveling inward first appears in known literature in him, and the idea that this inward journey was an ascent terminating in a place utterly beyond anything describable, a kind of nothingness which lies at the root of all reality, or alternately a state of utterly undifferentiated consciousness with no contents, with no affects, with nothing but a consciousness. Um, this, I think, is probably of interest to psychedelics researchers, right? Um, so for all three types of the, these uh, psychedelic experiences, uh, the noetic ascent journey, the divine encounter, and the ineffable ascent to the one beyond being, we have trip reports. And so that's what we want to talk about today. But first, a little bit of boring history. 
to set a kind of stage for uh, upon which to hang some of these ideas because it's heady stuff. Uh, Plato of Athens, of course, as you all know, lived from the 430s or thereabouts, the 420s BCE, um, until about the year 348, 347 BCE, the, the height of the grandeur of classical Athens. He was the student of a guy called Socrates, who was a sort of mendicant, barefoot, wandering, um, dropout culture philosopher guy who, who uh, pissed off the people of Athens so much that they had him executed famously. Uh, he, was, he was seeking truth in a very public and intentionally annoying way. But Plato uh, didn't follow Socrates' model and not write anything down and just go out and do philosophy in public. Instead, he chose to write fictions. He wrote, he invented a genre called the prose philosophic dialogue and took a bunch of people from Athens of his day and from Greece of his day, like actual people, some of whom were dead, some of whom were actually still alive at the time, and just put words in their mouth, made them into characters in these dramas, and made them try to get at the truth and have arguments with Socrates and stuff like this. So a very weird and tricksterish way to promote philosophy. Um, now, Plato is often understood in the sort of annals of uh, what you might call modern analytic philosophy as a, a dry, almost one might say, almost dickheaded rationalist. Um, uh, and this is the, the so the, I've got this painting of uh, Plato and Aristotle from Raphael. It's not, I, I'm not a big fan of this painting, but ancient Platonism is not a very visual culture, so you don't really get much visual stuff. But we see here Plato gesturing up and Aristotle gesturing down, or Plato saying the ceiling needs doing, and Aristotle saying, no, it's the floor, we've got to do the floor, whatever they're, you know. The, the point here is that the image of Plato, the, the idea of Plato until very, very recently, um, has been of Plato, the, um, the manic, mystic, inspired, prophetic figure who brings, who's maybe does magic and is, is about um, divine possession and mania. The idea of Plato, the, the dry um, metaphysical arguer, is a very, very recent minting. In fact, you can't trace it much before the 18th century. So that's something to keep in mind. The idea of Plato, the guy who's going, Wah! that's how everyone understood Plato until recently, right? So maybe we can, we can crack the um, Plato was a boring, quote unquote, rationalist. If he is a rationalist, well, he is a rationalist in the philosophic sense, but that involves things like divine possession. Uh, so that's our picture representing that whole tradition. Now, Plato set up a philosophic framework in his dialogues, the, these works of his, that I will argue today um, was a framework which could be pursued in search of highly psychedelic experiences or self-transformation um, things. The Platonists wouldn't necessarily call them experiences, especially because there's no word for experience in ancient Greek or Latin, but they would call it uh, a transformation which is both epistemological and ontological, because epistemology <laughs> and ontology are inseparably linked in Platonism. So I'm not making any claims about Plato's own positions, and I feel like I'm a kind of we weirdly agnostic about what Plato means, partly because he is a trickster who writes dialogues in which he hard the only time he ever appears in the dialogues is when someone says, where was Plato? Oh, he wasn't there. So he's like playfully saying, I wasn't even there. I'm, I'm absent, right? He's not there. There's no authorial voice in Plato. Uh, we don't know what Plato thought. But he did set up a framework for thinking which led to a psychedelic philosophical way of life in antiquity. That's my claim. And what are some of the aspects of thought that come from Plato that are so psychedelic? Well, the first of all is that the famous Platonic theory of forms is totally psychedelic. So the idea of the theory of forms is, first of all, it never appears as a theory in Plato's dialogue. You have to reconstruct it. You have to decide what it is. But the idea is for things like thinking or language or even existence of individual things with continuity, like a wall that stays a wall. It doesn't like, it's not a wall. And then you look away and you look back and it's a cat, right? For any of that stuff to happen, there must be immaterial, incorporeal, I should say, eternal, unchanging verities. These are forms. What exactly they are is much debated and was much debated throughout antiquity. 
But these are the forms. Um, they have to exist for anything else to exist. They're the kind of sine qua non of thinking, of communication, and so on. Now, what adds to the psychedelia sort of side of this is that this theory, which is which is argued about in very dry terms in some of the dialogues, is also very influentially expressed in the dialogue of Phaedrus as a place. Well, in the Phaedrus, you are in this flying chariot with two horses, one of which is unruly and one of which is well tempered. But if you can get your well tempered horse to be the dominant horse, it will take you up in the train of the gods in a geocentric cosmos. So the earth is in the center and then you have the planetary spheres. And when you get to the outermost sphere, if you have like supreme effort, but that's the gods have gone on ahead, but you're trying to join them. And if you can just poke your head out of the outermost <laughs> sphere, you will see the world of the forms. You will see these eternal verities. It's a world of light. It's a world of like visionary, overwhelming beauty. And that's where the gods are feasting on nectar and ambrosia. Obviously you wanna join them, right? So this is a goal of the Platonist philosophers to fly out of the cosmos to a place, a noe, noetos topos, a noetic place, also called the plane of truth that exists outside the cosmos. Okay, that's an influential and very psychedelic image of what the world of forms is like. And now, and then we remember that it's not a world, it's part of everything and come up with a theory based on that. Um, the Phaedo, also the dialogue where Socrates dies, where he commits suicide on the order of the, um, the Athenians and has his final chat with his friends and colleagues. Uh, in that, uh, he talks a lot about eternal verities, forms in that uh, dialogue. And along with proving in a number of ways that there must be a place where souls were uh, between before and after death. So before and after life and death. So uh, in other words, it's often called an argument for the immortality of the soul, but it isn't. It's, it's an argument for a place where souls hang out. He topos. Again, uh, he um, gives a very, very psychedelic visionary account of the true earth. You might think you know what the earth is like, but it turns out the earth, the true earth, which is much bigger than our earth, and our earth is like nestled inside it in all these weird chasms with mud sloshing around and all kinds of stuff, is a giant shining multicolored dodecahedron. And that the true people who might be our higher selves live on the surface of that earth while we're inside it. And much else to interest uh, people who are interested in kind of visionary, weird, um, accounts. Then we have, very importantly, the Republic of Plato, and uh, especially a work called the Symposium, which is a drinking party suffused with homosexual eros, in which <clears throat> it turns out that homosexual eros can be harnessed to ascend, and ascent is key here, to ascend from individual beauties, like you, sir, are very beautiful, if I may say so. And I see you, and that's great, but... What I have to realize then is that actually all of you people are beautiful. There's a beauty in everyone. And what is the common thing? There must be something that isn't, it isn't like the symmetry of your nose, fantastic though it may be, nor is it, is it the um, genteel angle of repose in which you sit. It must be something that transcends all these kind of gestural and symmetrical things, a, a, something like beauty in itself. That's what I want to, that's what I'm really in love with. That's why sex, with boys, which is Plato's normative, um, you know, kind of framework for like what you want to do sexually. Um, that's great and everything, but really what you want to do is fall in love with the ultimate disembodied beauty. And this is expressed as a, a method of ascent powered by Eros. That's something you're going to pursue. Now, here we don't have an otherworldly journey like in the other two examples I gave, right? We have more something like a philosopher sitting in a room thinking hard might be able to do this. Well, in these other, you know, you need a winged chariot, you need the higher earth, you need like some otherworldly stuff. But the Platonists are going to read all of these accounts together, right? So this method that, oh, and by the way, this method of uh, ascent to the beautiful itself is expressed in the dialogue by Socrates, who says, I was initiated into the mysteries of erotic love by this woman called Diotima of Mantinea, and she, this was her initiation. So this is even expressed by Plato as something like 
even Socrates doesn't get this. This is like the real stuff in a way. It's, it's very much a privileged discourse as it's set in the dialogue. Now that ascent toward the truth journey motif, right? That's why both why the theory of forms is psychedelic and why is part of the framework of why Platonism was a, a very good way of thinking for a psychedelic journey type practice. Secondly, Plato, as, as a side note, but one that's going to be interesting to uh, psychedelic researchers, he in the especially in the dialogue Timaeus, where we have we get a kind of cosmology of the of the cosmos, what it's made of, how it was made. It is a the entire cosmos is a living being, conscious living being. We're all parts of this living being, and the entire universe is one interconnected living whole. With uh, synesthesia, like like if if something happens to this part, it's felt throughout the whole thing. And the human being is a microcosm of this macrocosmic structure. So that idea of a microcosm, macrocosm, um, binary, <laughs> first appears in Plato's Timaeus, he invents it. The idea that the universe is a sympathetically linked living being also first appears in Plato, as far as I know, uh, and he invents that as well. Finally, higher modes of consciousness. So Plato really, really gets into this idea that there are different types of knowing, different types of epistemological activity. There's something called doxa, which is opinion, which is not rated highly. It's like the kind of stuff you see on the internet when people talk about politics, like, well, I think, blah, 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 right? He's like, nonsense. I don't even care why you think you think that. It's just not even worth my consideration. What I'm looking, thinking about is knowledge of truth. And because of the theory of forms and things I can't really get into now, the knowledge of truth is going to have to be contact with the forms. And this is going to be synthesized by the later tradition as something called noesis. So um, noose is a word that's often translated as intellect, but it's nothing like we mean by intellect. Um, I'll, get, I'll get into what it is more like in a, in a second. Um, noesis is the action of doing noose, is what you engage in if you are cognizing noetically. And the things you are going to cognize are the forms, which are Noita, they're noetic things, noetic realities. Now, and I'm oversimplifying because there's numerous discussions of leveled epistemology in Plato, which correspond to leveled ontology. So the more real something is, the more you might need a special uh, faculty of cognition to encounter it, and the more removed from everyday modes of knowing and thinking that cognition will be, if that makes sense. So, um, what the tradition of Platonism will come up with in this context that's most of interest to us, because there'll be a whole long flourishing theory of um, how forms could work, how epistemology could be explained in terms of forms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Peter will be more familiar with that than I am, actually. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion, right, in philosophy today. Yeah. Still, still, it's probably perennially, it will always be ongoing. Um, but there's a certain branch of Platonism that takes the hands-on approach in the antiquity of like, okay, noesis or noose, first of all, taking all the hints in Plato, synthesizing them with some crucial bits of Aristotle and some other stuff, which I won't get into unless you want to ask about it later, is going to be a form of consciousness which is fundamentally self-knowledge. And what it is self-knowledge of, it's knowledge of a noose in a noose knowing its own contents, which are the forms. So a noose is a mind containing the forms, which are immaterial and eternal. And any act of noesis is a unity such that the noose itself, the act of noesis, and the contents of that noesis are one thing. So the knower, the known, and the act of knowing are unified and all of this takes place outside of time and space. So it's eternal, right? So that's pretty interesting, kind of psychedelic. But then it gets even more interesting because it turns out the noose is also the, this place that we talked about in Phaedrus. So it's a noisos topos, it's a cosmos, and you can go there and live there. And all we find out all kinds of interesting stuff about this place. And it's also, last but not least, the supreme god of the universe. So there is a a kind of overmind, you might say, for Platonists, which is the noose. Our cosmos is inside it, 
although it does not have dimensions or uh, occupy space in any way. And it is pure goodness and being. It's pure being, that's the most important thing. It's overabundant being. Okay, and life, it's alive. So that's our psychedelic framework. Now let's talk a little bit about what Placidism was. I'm going to really blast through this because it's maybe essential to talk about, but it's um, also kind of probably boring. But Plato died. He had a couple of followers. He set up a kind of school called the Academy in Athens. He had a couple of followers who were actually his nephew and amazed at his nephews. And it seems to have petered out. That's what's known as the early Academy. Then in the Hellenistic period, the school or the name of the Academy was taken over by the so-called skeptical Academy. And these guys were hardcore skeptics of the, you can't be sure of anything, not you can't even be sure that you can't be sure of anything school of skepticism, right? Like all belief is nonsense. Even the belief that all belief is nonsense is nonsense. Paradox, wow, you know, that kind of skepticism. And then in the early Roman imperial period, about the first century BCE at the earliest, you have what's called the dogmatic term. This is when what we know as Platonism is born. So this is people, basically the only kind of working definition of an ancient Platonist that we have that's any good, is someone who thinks Plato has a teaching, so is a dogmatist, has a teaching. He's not just like a, a skeptic who's playing with ideas to blast everyone's mind from believing anything. He's someone who has a teaching. Most likely he expresses it esoterically um, within the dialogues, and we are followers of that teaching. So first we have to figure out what the teaching is, then we maybe want to explain why it's true, and so on. This is a Platonist. The term platonikos, platonikos in Latin and Greek do exist, but they're not used very much early on. They, they come into being mostly later. So it, to some extent, Platonism is a construct of modern scholarship, but it, it is a reality enough on the ground that it's an okay term to use. I hope that's clear. Now this Platonist school of thought goes right through antiquity and then through various mutations comes to influence all the main monotheist traditions in uh, Europe and well in the West. And so it's a very important philosophic tradition. In this later, in this sort of Roman period, you have uh, two rough divisions that are often made, Middle Platonism and Neoplatonism. Uh, all you need to know about that is that Neoplatonism starts with Plotinus and it's everyone after him in the third century. So that was the boring part. Thank you for your patience. So I would like now for the rest of my time to talk about um, what's so psychedelic about Platonism. Um, because it's really more psychedelic than psychedelic in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, let's talk about ascent and states of consciousness in Platonism. So there's no word for consciousness in ancient Greek, as I mentioned. There's words for undergoing something, like, like what we would call an affect, I guess. There's something like that. But there's no word like erfahrung or consciousness like we have in modern European languages. Um, I don't think people really thought in those terms. Obviously, you know, if you got hit on the head, they, they, they knew how to talk about that, like something happened to you, but they didn't, uh, they never made that second order term. Like I had a consciousness of being hit on the head. They just said, I got hit on the head or I felt pain or something like that. Significant, actually, for what's to come. Um, now, what is also significant, I think, for psychedelic Platonism is that the way ontology and epistemology are mixed together is really, really significant. So an antithesis, you might argue, of a um, Platonist view of epistemology might be a uh, modern <coughs> epiphenomenological view of consciousness, which is like, there's this thing called the brain. It's a, uh, an arrangement of matter in a certain way. And that certain way of arranging matter gives rise to this extra thing that just appeared like through some evolutionary process called consciousness. And we're experiencing it, you know, presumably, although there's all these kind of questions about how do I know you're conscious and all that kind of stuff. And you've all been down that hole. You're all psychedelics researchers, you know, all this stuff, but, um, Platonism is like, no, that's just obviously provably false. But what Platonism does say, or tend to say, is that the higher forms of consciousness, we'll, we'll call them, I'm going to say consciousness a lot, but by consciousness, just please read epistemological activity, right? 
So all the Greek words or the Latin words that are used to describe different kinds of knowing, thinking, remembering, noesis, which can't be translated. Um, all of that is what I mean by consciousness, okay? All of these modes of consciousness have their appropriate reference. So for example, you might have episteme, which is like scientific ordered knowledge. So you study mathematics, that's an episteme. Um, and that is the appropriate form of consciousness for studying mathematics, right? But mastering a, a field of scientific knowledge, seeing how it works, so on. But you might have higher form of consciousness and, and by higher, I mean, like to sort of literally higher in, a, in an ontologically grounded way, which is noesis. Now, noes, in noesis, like, you know, sort of, so say you study the episteme of mathematics, that's great. But in, um, in noesis, you can directly encounter the triangle itself, right? And if you say, why should there be a triangle itself? A placeness would respond, well, how can there be all these partial triangles if a triangle doesn't exist, right? How can there be all these like, I often use pizzas as an example here, like pizzas are all circular, um, but none of them are actually circular because we all did geometry and we know that a, a geometric circle a pizza does not conform to that, but it, it's as it were reaching for something or to be reaching for this thing called circularity, there has to be a circularity, right? If you do noises, you can, you, well, not, I mean, in some sense, become the circle because in the act of knowing the circle, doing noises of the circle, there is no difference between you, the circle, and the act of knowing the circle. And it's taking place eternally. But actually, all acts of noesis have, as it were, already occurred from the time bound perspective because they're eternal, which is one to think about. Um, so let's talk, let's have our first trip report. Um, there's a very, very interesting thinker called Philo of Alexander. <coughs> who is a Jewish philosopher from the first century BCE, straddling into the first century CE. He lived around the time like Jesus was around, uh, lived in Alexandria, Hellenized Jew, extremely well read in Greek philosophy. And he is largely what you might call a Platonist with some Stoic elements and some so-called Pythagorean elements thrown in. However, um, he would not put it that way. He would say, uh, Moses is the greatest philosopher Plato cribbed all his best ideas from Moses, but that's as it may be. Um, he reads, he does what's called philosophic exegesis. So he's, he's a Jew, he's a believing Jew, and he's really into what we know as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the, the so-called Bible. But it's all, it's all esoteric philosophic text. And that's great and everything. He has a very strong theory of noose. God is a noose. The reason that the bit in the book of Genesis where it says God created us in his image because we also have noose. We are in the image of God in that we have access to the forms, that we have a noetic aspect to our consciousness. Cool. Um, a move that would be repeated again and again in, in philosophic Abrahamic faiths. But um, he has an experiential hands-on take on the noose. So this is our first report of a noetic journey that I'm aware of um, in, the, in the Western annals. It's pretty wonderful. It's from uh, Philo's work on the creation of the world, and it goes like this in English. Uh, he's talking. He's talking about. He's he's going from that bit I just told you about how he justifies we are in the image of God because of we have noose, and noose is amazing, right? It's godlike. Check this out. He's talking about noose and what it can do, right? Winged once again. So there's going to be a lot of references here to the Phaedrus myth. There's going to be a lot of references here to mystic initiation of the a pagan kind so polytheist kind a lot of references here to jewishness and um a lot of references to visionary experiences of various sorts this is normal philo of alexandria so um he's a he's a, a mystic initiate platonist jew which was which was a thing and winged once again noose is raised up and having surveyed the airy region and its vicissitudes, is born higher to the Aether and the celestial orbits. Just as a side note here, remember we're in a geocentric cosmos. So um, the universe is concentric spheres with the earth at the center. This is the, the terrain that he's passing through in his journey. Um, the celestial orbits and joins, remember this is his noose, 
joins in the circling dances of the planets and the fixed stars according to the perfect laws of music. Perfect harmonic relationships among the planets and celestial bodies. And you can uh, join in. Following the love of wisdom, which leads it, having overtopped the entire sensory reality, there it longs for the noetic reality. So you're not there yet. And having contemplated in that place the paradigms and ideas of the sensory things it saw here, uh, paradigms and ideas, synonyms for forms. Having contemplated in that place the paradigms and ideas of the sensory things it saw here, surpassing beauties, it is possessed by a sober drunkenness and divinely inspired like the mystic celebrants and is filled with another desire and a better longing. Led by this toward the high summit of the noetic realm, it seems to approach the great king himself. And while it longs to see pure and unmixed rays of thronging light pour forth like a swollen stream so that the eye of the discursive mind is dizzied by their radiance. So classic noetic ascent account from Philo, as almost always in these accounts, there is a, within the noose, there is a highest point. And when you get to that point, noose itself somehow breaks down. It either stops being noose because it cannot contemplate that which is beyond it. In this case, a trend, the, the Hebrew God, which is also a transcendent noose that transcends this kind of limited noose, right? Or otherwise something apophatic happens in the text where we can't talk about what happens next. Um, Philo, which incidentally, is the first person that I've come across in the Western canon who definitely talks about an idea of ineffability. He says he adapts this old Greek word, aritos, which meant unintelligible uh, or alternately unpronounceable. Like you're describing a foreign language and you're like, that's oh, a real jawbreaker. It's aritos. You can't pronounce it with your mouth. It's unspeakable. Uh, he adapts that. He, he changes the meaning of that to mean formally ineffable in a sense that is familiar to sort of like cognitive linguists and uh, philosophers, right? Like an experience that cannot be put into words by its nature because it transcends the ability of words to describe, yeah? Now that is old hat for probably everyone in this room. Probably everyone in this room or any, anyone who works with psychedelics is very familiar with the idea of like trying to explain an experience and going, but I yeah, you know? Or, or talking to someone else who's taken maybe the same very potent uh, cocktail as you did and, and just going, and they're like, right? You know what I mean, but I can't say it. And like, yeah, I, this is very familiar. The, the notion of putting that into words, of saying there are things which are ineffable that cannot be put into words. This guy invents it, as far as we know, which is, which is interesting, right? So that's our, what I take up as our first, that's one sort of trip report or a journey narrative from Philo, a very interesting one in my view. Uh, um, and there are other ones in Philo as well, which we can kind of use to back that up. And it seems that he had this experience quite a bit, this experience of going upwards through the cosmos, somehow participating in the movements of the stars and planets, and then encountering this divine noose. One is tempted to think of contemporary um, Second Temple Jewish apocalyptic literature, in which when approaching the divine throne room, the light of and majesty of, of God is always so great that you basically can never quite get there. You have to stop in like the anteroom or three heavens down or whatever. This is a trope. We don't have any evidence that he read any of this material, but he's, if, if there is such a thing as a Platonist apocalyptic Jewish text, that's it, right? Um, now let's move, let's jump ahead a bit. We'll, we'll talk about Plotinus. Um, in books on, he, Plotinus lived in the third century, born in Egypt, lived in Rome. In books about mysticism, very significantly, William James's um, varieties of mystical experience, varieties of religious experience, religious, religious experience, which is about mystical experience. Uh, Plotinus is taken almost silently as the paradigm of what it is to have a mystical experience. Um, and that, that the whole pint, the um, the four characteristics of mystical experience. One is that it's uh, temporary. One is that it's something and something. And the, the other one is noetic. That's an N. So what does that mean? Well, basically it means what Plotinus says it means. Although that's not what William James says. That That is in fact what he's doing. Um, now, 
Plotinus is a deeply psychedelic Platonist. Um, he wrote firsthand accounts of, of ascent. He's been to the noose. He wants to tell you what it's like, but he can't, so he does his best. And he's even been beyond the noose. Because for Plotinus, unlike the middle Platonists earlier, like Philo, the, the supreme reality of the universe is not uh, noose anymore. It's something called the one, but it cannot be called the one because no names can actually be applied to it. It's fully ineffable. Uh, it, it is unnameable. It's a pure simplicity, which is not even simple. Uh, that kind of thing. That's the sort of basis of reality. The noose comes from that, and that, the one, is the thing you really, really long for. When, you, when you've attained the noetic reality and experience the noetic beauties and the eros of the noose, if you're a really philosophic person, you're even more warning for what's beyond, right? You, you don't stop there, you're like, you must keep going. And the encounter with the one is one of the most uh, paradox-ridden and um, paradox-laden, apophatically expressed um, accounts of human consciousness that we have in the whole kind of dossier of, of thought. And he gives us some, he gives it a damn good try. For someone who says that this cannot be put into words, he's like, but I'll try again, and I'll try again, and I'll try again. Never quite to get there. But I'd like to read what you might call a, a trip report from uh, just the noose, just the, the lower level of what it's like. Remember I said the noose can be seen as a kind of place, a non-spatial, non-temporal place. What it's like to be there. Um, this is where also the locus classicus for the idea of a journey inward. So there are specific spiritual practices recommended by Plotinus. They include stripping from the soul all that which is not the noose. So separation from the body. Um, this probably took the form of mild asceticism, but it also took the form of uh, a systematic way of thinking that just saw through phenomena to their essence all the time, such that your soul stops being a soul and becomes noose, which it already is. Um, and he gives some really cool thought experiments, which I'd, I'd like to come back to one right at the end. But um, if you practice that kind of thing long enough, this might happen. Often, awakening to myself from the body and becoming separate from all other externals, going within myself, I have seen an extraordinarily marvelous beauty. Convinced then that this was far the better portion, I actually lived the best life and was assimilated to the divine. Establishing myself in that, I came to that noetic reality above all others and established myself there. That's the higher news that I was talking about, that Philo was talking about as well. After this establishment in the divine, having descended from intellect, news to discursive reasoning, I am baffled by how I have now come down and how my soul has ever come to be within the body when it has shown itself to be of such a nature by itself, even when in the body. So he's had this revelatory experience often and it's going within, but then he has to descend. So it's clearly going up as well in some way, it's an ascent. And when he finds himself back in normal, what we probably today would just call normal consciousness because we like to psychologize everything. Um, he's like, what is going on? This doesn't make sense to me because I've seen the true beauty. I've seen the true reality. And this reality just doesn't seem real. I'm, I'm uh, waking out about it, right? Interesting from the perspective of psychedelic research, I would say. Um, and if anything can be described as a paradigmatically psychedelic account, it seems to me, that that would be in that book, that book, like uh, the Uxbridge reader of psychedelic trip reports or whatever, like you'd have to have Plotinus at the beginning, you know? Um, now, there's a bunch of other stuff in Plotinus that's really weird about the news. So it's a world, it's a place you go, it's a place he goes all the time. But um, you might think, oh, it sounds like some kind of static heaven where everything's just frozen because it's like eternal verities and there's no kind of, nothing really going on. But it turns out that you have a body there. Your body is like an eye that sees in all directions simultaneously. There is communication between other people in the news and gods in daimonis. You can talk, you can communicate with other entities there, but not with words. 
And this is pretty cool. We like that that eye thing, right? Like it's an eye that sees in all directions at once. But um, we have this really wonderful account of a complete synesthetic experience. So it's not just an eye that looks in every direction. It's all of the senses functioning all at the same time as one sense, like a hypersense, and experiencing all possible objects of sense at the same time. So imagine listening to all music ever that ever could exist at once and smelling every smell that could ever exist at once and all of that being one experience. Can, can you tell us what it's like? Um, that is to say, to seek the origin of, okay, this comes into philosophic discussion of what an animal is. That's the context, but he's about to go synesthetic. So let's follow him there. To seek the origin of an animal is the same as to seek the origin of life and of universal life and of universal soul and of the eminently universal noose. There being no poverty or lack of resource there, all things there being full and as it were, seething with life. Okay. All things have a sort of flow from a single spring, not as from a single breath, single heat, but as if there were a single universal quality, like a qualia, a qualium, right? A single universal qualium that is all qualia, containing and preserving all the qualities within itself, that of sweetness along with fragrance, being the quality of wine simultaneously with being all the possibilities of tasting, acts of seeing colors and what is known through touch, being what hearing hears and simultaneously all the melodies and every rhythm. Boom. And that's eternal. That's happening all the time, but you're just not aware of it right now. That's how you're able to incidentally to have all the lower aesthetic experiences, like my feeling of touch and my smell and sense and hearing an actual track of music or whatever. All of that is possible because this total synesthetic noesis happened in my noetic body. And I say happened in the past tense, but what I mean is eternally uh, happens. So I consider that fairly psychedelic. And I'm running short on time. In, in a way with, with Platonism, the action really is in the noose and the noetic experience. I should say that later Platonists like Porphyry and Iamblichus and Proclus also have a lot of these noetic experiences that they record, though none with such an amazing first person account form as Plotinus does, where you really, really get the sense that Plotinus is had some crazy ass experiences and he's doing his best to put them into words to help other people have those experiences. And as I mentioned right at the end, we are going to, he's going to help us because we're going to do one of his spiritual exercises. But before we do that, um, we should talk about the union with the one, which again is something Plotinus describes having experienced, but, but it's not an experience because there's nothing to experience. This is where we get in the Platonist tradition this very strongly apophatic, what's often called apophatic mysticism. Does the word apophatic mean anything to people? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is if you're trying to describe that which is undescribable by its nature, um, the best thing you could possibly maybe do is say what it isn't. So you might be a Christian mystic describing God and you say God is not uh, evil, for example. Okay, we can all agree on that. But then what, when you try to say what God is, you can't. So you say, God is not even not evil. And you get into these self-recursive forms of language which attack themselves and unsay what they've just said. This is what apophatic discourse is. It's often called negative theology or via negativa, but it needn't be theological. Um, and it needn't be negations. But what it will be is a recursive kind of uh, language which is attempting to dismantle itself in some way so as to deconceptualize your thinking. It's like, I'm going to give you some conceptual things, which are words, but the point here is that you don't have concepts about what I'm talking about because it transcends all concepts. So let's try to create that sort of non-conceptual space in your mind using the, the limited tool of language that we have. Uh, there is some great stuff in Plotinus of that nature and in later Platonism. And that whole tradition of apophatic mysticism, quote unquote, is very much comes from Plato in, in the dialogue, the Parmenides. Um, but Plotinus, what all of the descriptions of the so called mystical union with the one seem to have in common, both on the theoretical level, like what Platonists theorize is happening 
and on the kind of gibbering apophatic account of what it's like that we sometimes get seem to be saying that there's something if we want to approach it in terms of consciousness something like a completely undifferentiated consciousness a consciousness that has no content no self-awareness no like that that sense of i-ness that that we often have when we're awake in our day-to-day -day life like i'm experiencing stuff and the, the, the presupposition is that there's this i doing the experiencing that sense gone completely gone but also not the sense that like there's this <clears throat> primal thing called the one and i'm standing in front of it not that but also not there's this primal thing called the one and i've realized that i'm the same as it i've unified with it not that either this is an experience if it is an experience which cannot be put into words and of course if the word experience had existed in uh ancient greek they would have also said it's not an experience they would have denied that as well it's something it's often called an arretos dunam uh, arretos energia a uh, a, um, ineffable actuality or an ineffable doing an ineffable happening it's described in all kinds of ways these uh descriptions are then always at least in the really serious players like Plotinus and Proclus immediately demolished oh I just said it's an ineffable uh actuality it's not that either don't get don't get stuck on the actuality thing because it's not an actuality like this is apophatic mysticism in its uh performative mode Plotinus is a master of this and Iamblichus and Proclus especially is a master of it in a completely different way um now that is pretty trippy stuff I would argue and however I haven't even talked about talking to gods and dead people yet so I will just spend maybe five minutes if I can impinge on your time and say uh, that um later Platonism after Plotinus but also happening during Plotinus's time developed also something called theurgy or the hieratic arts and these guys were very much into doing ceremonies, uh, cere what would be called ceremonial magic by a lot of uh, observers, but they call it philosophy, <laughs> or, <laughs> or uh, they call it the hieratic art. It's an adjunct, it's a wing of philosophy, it's like a sub branch of philosophy. And one of the things you could do with this, one, one of the things you could do is purify your soul, uh, which makes the ascent we talked about earlier easier. So you might think, if you're going to ascend to the noose, you need to get rid of concepts and strip your body. This, this stripping I talked about, the aphirus, you might need to strip away like extraneous ideas to get to the true root of things. Yeah, yes, but also you need to like do some rituals to actually purify your soul in a very concrete way. So they're doing that. They're uh, making statues come alive, which is pretty interesting. But maybe the most psychedelic thing they're doing is uh, causing gods to appear in. Um, to the actual physical eyes in front of them. And uh, among the many, many wonderful descriptions we get of these epiphanei, they're usually just hints. But uh, the great philosopher, the great Syrian, Yamblikos, um, gives us like a typology, what the different orders of non-human person look like when they appear. So um, in brief, I declare that their manifestations, these are different non-human persons, are in accordance with their true natures, their potentials, potentialities and activities well as they are so they appear to those invoking them in other words the gods don't for yamkas don't take on uh like costumes or something they really appear to you they display their activities and manifest forms in agreement with themselves and with their own characteristic signs but to distinguish them individually the appearances of gods theoi, are uniform those of daimones are varied those of angels so yamblikos has a much more uh elaborate fauna of non-human persons than earlier like he's, he's absorbed angels from the semitic creeds and uh, archontes from other things so there's a lot of kind of critters in the universe um the, the, the angels are simpler than those of daimones but inferior to those of the gods those of archangels are closer to divine principles but those of archontes if you take these to be rulers of the cosmos who administer the sublunary elements are varied but structured in an orderly manner and so on and so forth um, I invite you to check out this uh, passage because it's long and it is a proper like bestiary style introduction to what non-human persons look like when they appear to your actual physical eyes. It's detailed. It's uh, full of like ways of making this happen. Um, also, I would argue kind of psychedelic 
and interesting. Now, you don't have to make gods and daimonists and stuff appear to you. So they can also just appear to you. Um, they can come in dreams, for example. They can come during rituals unbidden. Um, and that's equally real. But what is interesting is that these late Platonists developed a whole uh, ritual science, ritual practice for, for, among other things, bringing on these, uh, these sorts of visions. Um, do we have any in any evidence that they were doing psychedelics in any way, shape, or form while doing these things? Nope. Except that they were burning a lot of stuff. There was a lot of um, incense. Who knows what was in the incense? Well, we actually know sometimes what was in the incense and it wasn't anything psychedelic, but uh, who knows? They also used, we know for a fact from hints and Yamblukas that they used light, shining lights on surfaces and used something, something called photagogia, leading by leading the light. They use the image of the light kind of flickering as a means of seeing gods, which reminds me of, for example, the formative uh, experience of Jakob Böhme, who saw a light glinting off a pewter vessel and had a life-changing experience that he then spent the rest of his life uh, interpreting. That was his mystical moment, as it were, right? So uh, glinting lights often, uh, I think James even talks about this actually, often do lead to these very uh, intense, sort of peak experiences among people, it may be that they were intentionally exploiting that. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about all this stuff, but I do need to shut up now and, let, and take your comments. Before we do that, though, let us all do a Platinian thought experiment. So I said that philosophy is psychedelic, and you might think to yourself, okay, well, that's cool and everything, but how do you do it? Well, you don't just do it at a lecture like this. You do it as a way of life. It involves every aspect of life as the ancients did it. It involves your diet, it involves how you live, your marriage, your money, everything, the whole religion, the whole gamut is part of philosophic way of life. So you're not gonna just get there by, by doing a little, um, you know, like there'll never be a Platonism mindfulness meditation movement where you just strip away all that stuff and just do the Platonism, right? That's not gonna happen. But um, Plotinus wants you to go to the noose and stop being deluded that your nature is fundamentally a, a soul your nature is fundamentally the noose for him. Incidentally, the noose is, uh, maybe needs to be emphasized, it's not uh, a bunch of intellect. It's, it, there's one intellect that we all access the same intellect. Uh, so in a sense, our natures are all uh, one, this one overmind, but we also have individuality. It's part of why it's also paradoxical, but um, he does give us thought experiments for trying to use discursive thinking, what we're using right now, because I'm using language which takes place sequentially in time and space, and you guys are understanding my language um, sequentially, ideas following each other. Um, this is called dianoia or logismos. That doesn't exist at the level of the news because the news is non-discursive. It all happens at, as it were at once. But he, he does give us some thought experiments for trying to imagine what the news is like using dianoia, right? So using the tools of rational thought to try to destroy rational thought. It's maybe one way of it or try to supersede it with a higher form. Now, this is a really cool thought experiment. It's really hard to do. Uh, and it's something you can maybe, if, if anyone's intrigued, you can go home and just like, try this out, uh, see what happens. Um, let us then apprehend in our thought, if you'll all join me in, in uh, doing this to the best of your ability. It's, um, it's non-denominational. So if you're like a <laughs> particular faith or whatever, it doesn't matter, it's not gonna, well, it, may, it does invoke the use of the God. If you have a problem with that, you probably don't want to do this. Let us then apprehend in our thought this visible universe with each of its parts remaining what it is, without confusion, gathering all of them together into one as far as we can. So easy part one, right? We imagine absolutely everything that exists, everything. Imagine all of that as one reality, one universe, easy, right? So that, when any one part, it was easier probably in the geocentric days when the universe was, the cosmos was quite small. <laughs> it's harder now, but, but still, anyway, that's what you have to do, so get on with it. Then, that, so that when any one part appears first, for example, the heavenly sphere, the imagination of the sun, and with it the other heavenly bodies, follows immediately. And the earth and sea and all the living creatures are seen as they could in fact be seen inside a transparent sphere. So imagine there is this whole universe with all its detail, all the living things, everything. 
and all past and all future. And imagine you're sort of standing outside that and looking at it from the outside, as it were. So you see it all at once, right? Let there be then in the soul a shining imagination of a sphere having everything within it, either moving or standing still, or some things moving and others standing still. Keep this and apprehend it in your minds. So you've now enclosed the universe in this sphere in all its detail. And apprehend in your mind without getting rid of that one. Hold on to that one. Imagine another sphere which is identical to the first, but take away the mass. Take away also the places and the mental picture of matter in yourself, and do not try to apprehend another sphere simply smaller than the one you've just imagined. Don't shrink it, but calling on the God who made that of which you have the mental picture, pray to him, and he will come. <laughs> so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Not easy, right? Yeah, thanks very much. Fasc very fascinating. Um, questions, yeah, can you pick the questioners or would yeah, you like me to? Yeah, yeah. Um, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Thank thanks. you very much. Um, I was conflicted a little bit at the beginning about um, circular systems and um versus hierarchical ones and chariots moving forward and but you, you solved it for me the answer is pizza mm. so thank you very much for, for uh triangling that circle right on. um also i mean maybe got some thoughts about that or any you know platonic forms and how we might have addressed that the pizza problem um also if you could talk at all about you know the renaissance re-emergence of Platonism mm. and you know the Medici and yeah. the, well, the Platonic well, Academy, if that exists. The first question is really interesting, but I don't quite, I don't want to say what I think you mean. Tell me what you exactly mean. Oh, right. I, I, I don't know what I mean. It's, okay. uh, I'm merely latching on to a noetic. Right. <laughs> right. Well, for in order for us even to be talking about pizzas, there has to be a noetic pizza. It has to exist. It's, it's impossible otherwise that this conversation could be even taking place, apparently. Um, uh, maybe I'll talk about something concrete like That's Pacino. Um, yes, they, they, there's this story that widely told and very wonderful about how uh, Plato's works were lost for a long time in the Middle Ages and then get rediscovered in the Italian Renaissance by these uh, newly Greek speaking uh, occult Platonists like Marsilio Ficino, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, and so on and so forth. And it's all true, but it's not the whole story because A, it's never lost. Because it's existing within Islam and Jewish thought and even esoteric Christianity uh, in numerous ways, which are very detailed, but are very important, including the apophatic stuff, by the way, that like hardcore God cannot be put into words like the reality of God is a sort of shining emptiness. That school of Christian thought goes really directly to late Platonism. Um, but also, Plato had just been read in the Eastern Roman Empire throughout the whole Middle Ages in Greek by the so-called Byzantines. So it never died at all. Um, so this the account of the Italian Renaissance is this sort of rebirth is really privileging the Latin speaking part of the of Europe as the center of everything that matters, uh, which is historically just doesn't take long to think that why that's just obviously not the case because the world is a lot bigger than Western Europe. But it's also easy to see why it came to be seen as the case, because Western Europe has a high opinion of itself, right? Um, however, the story of the transmission of Platonism is much, much bigger. And the, that rediscovery narrative, it is true vis-a-vis -vis Western Europe. The only Platonic dialogue that survives in, in Latin throughout the whole Middle Ages is part of the Timaeus of Plato. Everything else was lost. It was translated by a guy called Calcidius probably in the early 5th century. So they had a little bit. They, they had a bit of Plato. They had that. They had accounts from other people like Aristotle yeah, talking about Plato. And then they had wonderful books like The Book of the Cow, which is a magical text attributed to Plato translated from Arabic, which in, it tells you how to make a homunculus through sex magic. So there's, they had a, a funny idea about Plato. Um, well, I mean, maybe that's an authentic work of Plato. I'm not, I'm not here to argue. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately. 
But um, so yeah, that's um, and a whole obviously a whole lecture on on that could be given if you if people are interested in the way a very interesting esoteric philosophical perennialist Platonism plays out in the Italian Renaissance. The works of Marsilio Piccino are absolutely fascinating. They involve magic. They involve using um, this later theory, the theurgic tradition I was talking about, using music to achieve that kind of stuff, like mm. using basically doing magical musical rituals, which are also healing rituals, um, putting you in contact with the gods, except we can't call them gods because we're Christians. Can I, can I just quickly come back to the pizza thing very quickly, because it relates to something in analytic philosophy, uh, philosophy Western thought. Um, Plato's forms are really, it's still a big question, and there's no agreement, and there's been about 3,000 years or 2,500 years of argument about this. Mm -hmm. You'll even get people like um, Gödel with the incompleteness theorems, who says, without Plato's forms, I couldn't have come up with the incompleteness theorems, and yeah. the incompleteness theorems themselves further fortified my belief in them. Very basically, Bertrand Russell gives a quick argument for the need of forms. If, like, you and I both have the, uh, have the um, idea of a circle, pizza, say, or yeah. the color white, Mm -hmm. To say that they are the same color or the same circle uh, means that they must transcend both of our thoughts because I've got my temporally indexed thought right now. You've got yours over there right now. They're not the same, obviously. They're numerically distinct, but they're qualitatively identical. So then the argument is, well, therefore, what is the ontological, what is the being of that circle? And um, yeah, and you get great thinkers like Whitehead, Santayana, Russell, early Russell at least, um, argue four forms, Gödel, like I said. Uh, Frege, the great logician, wrote an amazing essay called The Thought, which really should be called The Forms. Um, but it's an ongoing debate, and there's really no, no, it seems to, if you don't look into it, it seems like obviously there's no such thing as forms, right? They're, you know, but actually, when you really think about it, you get into these deep labyrinths of thought, and there's no, really no easy answer to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if, if a beta is actually trying to be a circle, or it's trying not to be a circle. <laughs> So oh, conception of the also, ideal pizza. Yeah. That's, that's uh, what I was counts. particularly, but mass is not my strong point. Pizza. I was more thinking in terms of a, you know, circular. You mentioned Egyptian esotericism, metic um, religion, and that the cyclical nature. I don't think I did, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you, you, I strongly mentioned that, that early. Yeah, yeah you, you spoke about you know scrolls in the desert. With, oh, that's true. Yeah, but right, there's a right. um, you know, Kemetic religion, Nile based religion is sort of circular. Based, isn't it? It's all about death and, and revival, and I was wondering whether that came into Platonism. Yes, well, uh, in the most, I can answer that very simply. They all believe in reincarnation because uh, Plato says yeah. we reincarnate. Plato says, as animals, animals or humans, or maybe potentially, there's the doors open for leaving the cycle and becoming a god. Uh, later Platonists, some of them did, said not animals, some said animals, yes. Um, it's quite odds with these images are sort of glare up. Which, sorry, say again? It's quite odds, isn't it, with Plato's images of glare up? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. One, one thing that the image of Plato, the modern Plato, the, the, uh, the Plato of analytic philosophy, he's been, he's been shorn of his mo largely dialogic context. Like if you read a paper in, in modern philosophy on, the, the, I don't know, the Euthyphro paradox or something in, a, in an analytic context, it won't say anything about the dialogue Euthyphro or who the speakers are. It'll say like, uh, "Let us take proposition A that God is." Bit, 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 bit. It would follow from this. Bit, 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 bit. Like, so you're losing the context and all the kind of wacky stuff, like doctrine of reincarnation or the weird visionary quests. Just it might not, might as well not be there. You won't. You could study. You could do a whole degree in philosophy. <clears throat> you could even do a whole degree in philosophy specializing in Plato. I dare say and never talk about any of this. It's been re it's been forgotten. Thank Next you. question, please. Yeah, um, in the corner. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I yeah, definitely powerfully defend the idea that philosophy per se is psychedelic, regardless of the drugs. Uh, reminds me of the apophatic stuff reminded me of a quote I heard recently from Suran. I'm, I'm tired of people telling me life is meaningless. Life isn't even meaningless. <laughs> That's um, a nice way of putting it. Um, it might not be Suran, but yeah. Um, I read it in Suran anyway. <laughs> someone, I think, one of his friends. And so I have two questions, basically. Um, 
one is more kind of linguistic, semantic, etymological, and one is more archaeological or historical. And the first question, I mean, like, thank you for reinstating the notion that doxa is opinion. As a Christian, I just wish I could tell other Christians that doctrines are opinions, you know. And, yeah. Um, and yeah. Well, there's dogma and doxa, of course. They're related right. etymologically, but they're not the same. Oh, are they cognates? No, this is, this, yeah. is the kind of, this is the kind of thing I'd like to pick your brain about, because... Um, so... Firstly, what is the difference between, we were quite privileged here in Exeter, we've got like, well, until recently, five Greeks, now four Greeks in Exeter who are really interested in, in their own, in their own culture, in their own, they're always correcting me with their demotic pronunciation, but what's the difference between gnosis and noesis? So, gnosis. Oh, gnosis, like, like any e -E Gnostics, yeah. And yeah, no, that's, that, neo is a verb to nod your head in a sense to something. And it's used in, in the so-called Gnostic texts to indicate the uh, procession of ontological levels down from the one in the the, the, the gods nodded to the heavens, to the realms below. That's neosis. That's neosis, N-E-U, if that's what you're talking about. No, I'm talking, I'm asking about like when, when William James refers to a noetic quality, yeah. noesis. Yeah. And um, that's the noesis difference between that and the gno, with uh, that the... Um, Early cults like the Gnostics were talking about knowledge in that sense. Oh, Gnostics. Yes. Okay, no, there's no yeah. relation at all. They're both, they're both, uh, Gnosis in Greek, in everyday yeah. language of Greek, means something like, uh, uh, like, like connaître in French. It's like, uh, recognize. Yeah. Know in the sense of being familiar with something, yeah. rather than know something like a science. Uh -huh. it's, uh -huh. it's that familiarity knowledge. That's all. <laughs> it's then adapted radically by a number of uh, largely Abrahamic um, weirdo thinkers in the first centuries mm -hmm. to indicate a privileged form of knowledge. And in the, then in Proclus, the late Platonist, he even privileges something called gnosis above noesis. Yeah. So right. this can be played with in the, you know, this gnosis business. That's a whole separate thing. But there's no etymological connection at all. It comes from okay. the verb gnosis. They, as separate as um, Kenan and Bisson. It's mm -hmm. like an Indo European. Yeah. yeah okay. But imagine Kenan and Bisson then run through the mill of someone like Hegel. Right, so uh -huh. it's like it's not just the etymological right. difference in these senses, but then the philosophical like armature that's been built on top of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very okay. very different. In other words. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. That's really really interesting. Um, and the other, um, it's kind of like a slight like quibble I had. You said Plato invented philosophy, but then of mm -hmm. course etymologically, vent to, to invent is to put into the air, right? To ventilate. No. No, Wenio in Latin doesn't mean anything to do with Wentos. I mean, it's a, it's just a coincidence. It means Wenio means to come. In Wenio means to come apart. Right. Hence to okay, that's great. Thank you. Yep. Perfect. And um, okay. And and the final question. You mentioned there's no hard evidence for. Um, no hard evidence for actual drugs being used, but when the that paper was recently translated from Catalan about the Demeter Persephone cult in Spain mm -hmm. and the Poterion that actually did have um, ergot like discovered on the Poterion. And I'm aware that that, that that might not constitute hard evidence because it's the religious periphery, not the religious center, but it's the same cult, right? It's Demeter Persephone, yeah. it's the same cult as was at Eleusis, and there is hard evidence for that having contained ergot in Spain, at least. Let's, let's, let's so, add, it, 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 so is it more or less likely that it would have been contained ergot in the religious center? Of course, that's the jump. That's the leap. That's I think there is hard evidence now. If I may say, yeah. ergot, ergotism is not what you call, like, it's, you're definitely not going to do it at a rave. It's like oh, a possibly fatal, extremely unpleasant yeah. Uh, experience that can be called psychedelic, but my understanding is it's usually more regarded as like uh, I was convulsing in agony for eight hours and then I died or didn't die. But like, they had like, have you not call that a psychedelic? That sorry, is in you, no, but, but if they had other ingredients like mint that would have calmed the gut and other things yeah. like antidotes within yeah. it, those those kind of like you know between your levels of plant knowledge, yeah. I don't see why they wouldn't have existed in yeah. Europe, and I'm waiting for the, the solid evidence. We have, we now have evidence that, yeah, de surprise, surprise, people used to take a uh, poppy, you know, like opium type stuff, 
that's been now well, isolated. Well, in the Demeter Sapi, the split set in the Paterion is hard evidence, right? It's hard evidence. No, it isn't. Because, well, because in, in um, a, a cache of rye grain that was found in France yeah. from the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. it was found to be absolutely riddled with ergot. That's taken as evidence that these people had a shitty diet and their food was probably poisonous. It's not taken as like they were cultivating ergot on purpose for some psychedelic. It's like ergot is a very dangerous yeah. fungal infection that gets into your rye flour. Mm. Um, and and there's something, I think the sample was something, something like a third of it was ergot. That's just a sucky, like moisture exclusion. And uh, it's, uh, it's a bad lot of grain that you have to chuck because it's going to kill people. But again, I'm I'm not angry at all when the, when this stuff if and when this stuff is really um, uh, found to be the case. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna vibe on that thing right there. Um, no, because I I find that I, I I totally you know make sense what you're saying that it's not evidence of their just because one vessel has been found that was ergotized somehow. It could be, it could be, right? Or, or, or you know, yeah. but, celebrating the mysteries at home. But, but, there's, but, there, but, there's, but there's something still to that question of whether they had or, or didn't have. I mean, I know that's not what your whole lecture was about. Your mm -hmm. lecture was about the spiritual practices and so on, and, and yeah. their, and their uh, you know, Plotinus yeah. and so on, <laughs> their um, uh, description of that. However, um, you know, there are like, I think it's Marcus Aurelius, this physician or something that talks about certain types of drugs that if you put that in wine, it had, you can get fantastic fantasies and so yeah. on. Yeah, there, that, there, there is some of that, right? Yeah. And, and, and I would also say it would make total sense to me that if like, for instance, that this talk of that in certain tantric schools in Tibet and certain sh sh tantric shamanism schools in, in India and so on, that there might be some kind of psychedelic rituals at the very higher echelons of those kind of cults, like when you've really gone through a lot of initiation. So yeah, it would totally right. make sense to me that there might be, there might have been groups back then that would have used psychedelics, but it just, we don't have any evidence sure. for it because it was so secretive, I mean, you know? Yeah, well, like the, the, the part of the mystique of the rituals yeah. of Eleusis is that we don't know what the hell happened and that's because it was so goddamn secret. And Lopteia seems to have been Quite uh, like um, what they, they Aristotle refers to as pathane, right? Which is not knowledge. It's it's more like well, we can probably the closest knowledge, empathy that path that like it's probably the closest feeling. word in ancient Greek to experience. Actually. Experience exactly. Yeah. So Pubbles. so you know, with all this, all of these philosophers talking about the pathane of the apopteia and Eleusis, a, a follow-on question from that would for me is so in in Exodus eleven. There's a very intricate um, list of plants that are psychoactive and synergistic for the incense and for the anointing oil for the Mashiach and, and the people of Israel <laughs> in the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, it's like if you it says if this is taken away from this context, basically, they shall be removed from the community. And that happened to Alcibiades, right, as well. When he took the Kikion the Kiki out no, of Eleusis, he, he was accused of got, revealing the mysteries. We don't even know exactly what that involved. Okay. So okay the idea that, right? that he did sacrilege is not, it's not really on the table. It's probably more like he and his mates were initiates. Well, we don't know. But it's but, interesting, like the more, you know, the, the, the preparation would may have been incredibly sober. And then, you know, when you reach the kind of center there's this mystery experience mm. that oh, we don't sure. well can i yeah, actually yeah, emily let me let me just say a, a one thing to that would be my takeaway to all of these these questions because i know everyone here is interested in plants and i'm interested in plants too yeah. um, um the, the point i want to make and i've made it already but i'll just reiterate it is mm. um that stuff is all intriguing it's it's uh, all to play for because we do have better analysis methods now and things are new things are coming to light and so on but um, I haven't seen any scholarship that gets any more toward a kind of like, oh, there was a European psychedelic tradition in antiquity than that, like, well, we found some ergot in a mug, right? <laughs> so, um, and yeah. I've seen, I've read a lot of this stuff, and I've yeah. looked at the Egyptian recipes for incense and all that sort of thing. So, I would say at the moment, we don't have much evidence. Um, would, it, but that being said, we don't have evidence that anyone in Northern Europe took uh, magic mushrooms until like the 1970s, right? 
Yeah. Are we really to think that these little Liberty cap mushrooms that go everywhere in October, no one ever ate them and went, whoa, that was really fun and cool. Like, is that, are we plausibly meant to think that? I don't find that plausible, but as a historian, like, um, sacred groves close to great grazing areas. Leave it aside. Yeah. But what I will say is the point, the really important point is that just like with the Siberian shamans who some of them will take, will get wasted on vodka. Some of them will like, you know, take whatever mushroom you give them. And some of them don't take anything at all. You don't need the psychedelic substances to explain the phenomenon. What you need is shamanism. And then like, oh, you've got mushrooms. Hell yeah, this could be even better shamanism. You know, make it easier for me to, to leave my body. But the point is leaving the body, the practice of that. And that's what I'm saying. Platonism provides a uh, framework for doing among certain of its practitioners. And I've tried to show you the sort of literary records of some of those practices and practitioners yeah. historically. Yes. Right. Yeah. And it's so it's, that it seems more to the point to me that there's the philosophic way of life that's somehow going to alter your body's ability to pick up these signals. We were talking about the mind as a radio. Does it talk about the body, the role of the body, and in veiling or helping you access the noetic yes. truth? Thank you for reminding me. By the way, um, I will say I have a, a catalogue raisonné. Bibliography of suggested further reading, which is going to go up online allegedly. And so people who are intrigued by different topics can check that out. There's a book that's just come out in Germany called uh like bodiliness in late antique theurgic Platonism. So that's the book you want. Okay. Uh, but yes, the, there's the, the subject of the body in Platonism is huge. Um, and it is roughly well, uh, for for Yamblichus and Proclus, the body is essential to uh, separation from the body, salvation, immortalization. The body is key. You have to dive into the body. It's like almost like sort of like reminds you of uh, Tibetan Buddhism type vibes, if you know what I mean. Well, for Plotinus, the body is just like the less said, the better. Get rid of it because the the action is in the noetic, which is non corporeal. So there's multiple range of takes on the body. He wrestled in the Olympics B. Hmm? Yeah, it's the second sorry, division sorry, Olympics. Uh, we also had two questions uh, oh, yeah. online, and we are oh, it's, it's live. So yeah. can you read them? You okay, cool. Yeah. Sorry. So what children? Um, <laughs> that looks good. That the how do we do? So fascinating. My first question is: Is that Mark third on the left in the picture? I have no idea who that is. Sorry. Secondly, more controversially. I would, it's probably Epicurus. Yeah. Well, I would have often wondered if Socrates was in fact a real person or whether he was a convenient fiction made up by Plato to stand in for his own idealized questioning style. Do we have other sources for Socrates' existence? Yes, we do. Uh, Xenophon, <laughs> another student of Socrates, wrote another Socratic dialogue. Uh, we have independent takes on Socrates by two different authors. We have and numerous accounts of other people who were around at the time, sometimes secondhand or whatever. But yeah, we have no doubt at all that Socrates was a real person. Was he used by Plato as a mouthpiece for his ideas? A hundred percent. Yes. So does, do we know anything about what Socrates actually taught? Uh, a minimalist interpretation would say, no, we don't. Um, how does what you've been talking about differ from shamanism or Seder? What is Seder? Does anyone know? Scandinavian magic. Oh, uh, yeah, from uh, in lots of ways that are too detailed to get into. Plus shamanism is a bullshit term. Um, Nikki to everyone. Also, I'm a great fan of Plato, the comedian. Many of his crazy writings are super understandable when he uses thought provoking stand up routines. Boom. That is such a good point. Such a good reading. He's hilarious. We don't even get all his jokes now, uh, but, but a lot of them are really funny. And there's lots of every level of humor from the extreme cutting irony that is Socrates' trademark um, to dick jokes, like <laughs> proper. Are there more, more questions? No, listen. no, thank you very much for the questions online people. Thank you for uh, tuning in. And thank you guys for questions.